Magnesium is one of the most important minerals because it's a cofactor for over 350 enzymatic reactions. In today's show, we're going to take a deeper dive into the different types of magnesium and help you better conceptualize which magnesium form you should consider for which condition. For example, if you would like to support and optimize brain health, mental wellness, even support sleep, for example, there's two magnesium forms that you should consider over the others. Now, in contrast, if you exercise a lot, if you go in the sauna, if you have musculoskeletal cramps and issues within your muscles, you might want to consider magnesium malate. If you want to optimize sleep and whole body magnesium health, for example, good evidence suggests you may want to consider magnesium glycinate. Now, but first, why should we care about magnesium? And this is a white paper from a company in Belgium that happens to sell a really unique magnesium raw material called ATA mag, which stands for magnesium N-acetyl torate. Now that's different from magnesium torate because it's like acetylated, such as N-acetyl cysteine. So let's get into this. The paper says magnesium depletion is associated with affective domain disorders, brain issues, anxiety, and depression. It was previously shown that decreased magnesium levels in the brain was associated with anxiety-related behavior in mice. Magnesium treatment was shown to reduce anxiety in other rodent studies. In human studies, magnesium supp supplementation reduces subjects suffering from migraines, PMS, eclampsia, hyperactivity, and arrhythmia. Now let's get into magnesium supplementation. There's a bunch of different papers uh, about this, but we have inorganic forms of magnesium and organic forms of magnesium. The inorganic forms I do not recommend, such as magnesium carbonate and magnesium oxide. In fact, and I've been in the dietary supplement space for over 20 years. I now have my own manufacturing facility. I will say that we never bring on magnesium oxide. This is probably the worst form of magnesium that you could have. Why is that? Because oxide really has no biologic function in the body. And so when you're thinking about which magnesium form should I take, you need to have a salt of some level. It needs to be magnesium something, whether it's oxide, citrate, glycinate, malate, taurate, taurinate, um, you know, L3 L3 and 8, I mean, it doesn't matter. You need to have some sort of salt. And you want to think about what magnesium is bound to and the health benefits of that particular compound. So in the case of the inorganic salts, magnesium carbonate and oxide, no physiologic function in the body. Now, I, I will just make a parallel here. When we think about B12, we also want to think about, well, does the cyanocobalamin, does cyanide, small amounts of it, micrograms, does that have any physiologic function? Not necessarily. So that's why we want to focus on things like adenosylcobalamin, hydroxycobalamin, methylcobalamin. So when we're thinking about salt and minerals of all types, even if we're thinking about zinc, we don't really want to have zinc oxide. We probably want to have zinc glycinate. So the same thing holds true for magnesium. So with the magnesium organic salts, we have citrate, we have malate, which is particularly good for skeletal muscle. We have glycerol phosphate, we have bisglycinate, we have N-acetyl taurinate, threonate, magnesium taurate as well. And these are all available in a lot of different dietary supplements. And I'll put a link in the description, my friends, for a formula that I recently formulated, not trying to promote that in this video, just helping you better understand. You know, it has the three different forms that we're going to be talking about a little bit more here. I'll pin that in the comments below. Um, I do like the malate glycinate as well as the acetyl torate. And so among these different vectors, it is necessary to distinguish the vectors having a well-known physiologic function such as n acetyl taurinate and threonate, and of those in which the vector does not have any physiologic function, such as oxide, citrate, carbonate, glycerol phosphate. So again, most of the magnesiums on the market, because remember, there's 6,000 dietary supplement companies and about 100 dietary supplement manufacturers. So most companies are just marketing supplements that they don't even make. They are marketing companies. And as a marketing company, they're focused on the bottom line, right? The lower your cost of goods and the higher your price, the bigger your margin is, the more money that you are making. So most companies, what they do is they do a proprietary blend. They load it up with magnesium oxide because it's the cheapest. It's like $4 a kilogram. And they don't give you the magnesium L3 and 8, for example, that's $190 a kilogram, or the magnesium acetyl torate because that's $160 a kilo. They give you the oxide and the citrate because they're really low cost and they give you high elemental yield on the label. 
But since we're focusing on optimizing health, I think it's important that we look at the different forms of magnesium and why they might be better, particularly for the brain. And this is where the magnesium acetylturonate is awesome because it's more fat soluble. It's lipophilic, which means that the acetyl group bound to the taurine helps the magnesium get into the brain better. Okay, so several studies have found that magnesium acetyl torate was rapidly absorbed, able to pass through the blood-brain barrier better, and had the highest tissue concentration levels in the brain, and was found to be associated with reduced anxiety indicators. And this was comparing magnesium sulfate, magnesium oxide, magnesium citrate, magnesium torate, and magnesium malate. Now, just a small point of differentiation here. I mentioned magnesium torate, and that is different from magnesium acetyl torinate. I know they sound a little bit similar, but magnesium acetyl torinate features an acetyl or a fat soluble a lipophilic compound bound to taurine. And that's going to enable increased uptake within the brain because, as you know, the brain is fat based, right? Mostly DHA, do doca sahexanoic acid. That's what your brain is made of, which is why it's very important for mothers to eat fish and take fish oil and to breastfeed because breast milk is enriched in DHA. And that's uh, what constructs the brain. Okay, so why is magnesium acetyl taurinate so effective? Well, it turns out that compared to the effects of most bioavailable magnesium compounds, such as magnesium L-aspartate and magnesium chloride, magnesium sulfate and magnesium oxybutyrate on systemic inflammation and endothelial detection in rats, fed a low magnesium diet, uh, the magnesium acetyl taurinate was significantly more effective in restoring levels of endothelial nitric oxide synthase compared to all other studied compounds. So I think that's important. Now, we hear a lot about absorption and bioavailability. A synonymous term there is bioequivalence. I think this is important to consider the percentage of ingested magnesium for which is made available for metabolic functions. Remember, magnesium is unique because it's a cofactor for 350 enzymatic reactions. So we wanted to get to the tissues. Well, uh, Dalich et al. Uh, did a, a comparison study looking at magnesium pitolate, chloride, aspartate, lactate, and magnesium acetyl taurinate. And they found that magnesium acetyl taurinate or ATA mag had much better bioequivalence compared to other magnesium forms in a magnesium depletion model. So I think that's important. The same authors also show that magnesium acetyl taurinate had protective effects on neuronal hyperactivity induced by a particular acid known as uh, kinic acid. So bioavailability studies have shown that the highest penetration in the brain is derived from the magnesium acetyl taurinate when compared to other magnesium compounds. So I think that's important. And they say that firstly, the lipophilic nature of ATA mag or magnesium acetyl taurinate due to the N-acetylation of the taurine facilitates a passage of the phospholipids of neuronal membranes. The second factor is the structural similarity of ATA mag to glutamic acid, which can explain its regulatory actions within neuronal hyperactivity. Now, going on to magnesium in the brain, how does magnesium affect the brain and protect the brain potentially from nitrogen-related stress known as nitrosative stress from NMDA-induced hyperexcitotoxicity. So we've heard a lot about MSG, and this is why many folks don't eat out or have uh, hydrolyzed proteins and sweeteners, and um, there's a lot of MSG in packaged foods and so forth. That is particularly problematic for the brain because it can induce neuroexcitotoxicity. And it turns out that magnesium acetyl torate can actually reduce some of the neuroexcitotoxicity. So I think that's important. It's also been shown to be protective against the endothelial tissue, which is the functional unit of your cardiovascular and circulatory system. So I think that's important. Uh, most of these studies are in animals, so that's a, a limiting factor here. Now, one study by Lambic et al. showed neuroprotective effects of magnesium acetyl torate against NMDA-induced excitotoxicity in animals was studied. So I think that's important. Now let's talk about magnesium in the brain, particularly for women and folks that are susceptible to migraines. This is where I think the research really supports magnesium use around PMS and menstruation and uh, associated with migraines. During the luteal phase of cycling women's cycle, there's a high oestrogen level that can induce neuroexcitotoxicity via increasing glutamic acid responses in the brain. And it turns out that 
the NMDA, NMDA receptor can be more receptive during a magnesium depleted state. And so one way we can calm down this NMDA receptor is by increasing magnesium levels in the brain. And there's research showing that in migraine sufferers, the, the brain has reduced levels of magnesium, and this causes a reduction in energy metabolism in the mitochondria. And it turns out that magnesium acetyl torate can actually be protective by increasing magnesium levels in the brain and possibly augmenting the NMDA induced neuroexcitotoxicity. Okay, so that is it for the white paper. What about dosages? Well, uh, the current research suggests, especially during the luteal phase of female cycles, that they consume 350 milligrams of the ATA mag twice per day for a total of 750 milligrams. Again, I will link a product in the description or pinned in the comments. You can use the code podcast at checkout uh, for a little bit more uh, a better discount on that, but I do recommend taking the magnesium acetyl torate with other magnesium forms to increase the total magnesium concentrations in other tissues in the body, not just in the brain, but also in the skeletal muscle and systemically. And so uh, a combination of magnesium malate, glycinate, and acetyl torate seems to be uh, a really nice way to go about supporting magnesium levels. So that is it, my friends. I will link in the description this white paper, and you can uh, download some of these studies if you want to learn a little bit more about magnesium in the brain and the bioequivalence or bioavailability. But this relatively new material from a company in Belgium that is offering now the magnesium acetyl torate, I think is really exciting, uh, as much or more exciting than the magnesium l 3 that has been popular for a lot of years. The magnesium acetyl torate is sort of a new magnesium that's out there, and I think it has really uh, compelling research and something that you should consider for optimizing magnesium health and supporting optimal brain health. So let me know what you think in the comment section below, my friends. Hopefully you found this video helpful. If you did, please hit that like button and we'll catch you on a future video down the road.